Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our interview with Frank Vukovic. Frank is a director of strategic partnerships at FastPath, which is a leader in audit, compliance, and security solutions for mid-market companies. Frank, thank you for taking your time and coming to our interview today. Hey, great to be here, Boris. Thank you, thank you. This is our second interview with uh, you guys from FastPath, and we had the first one a few weeks uh, back with uh, Aidan uh, Parisian, yep. and we saw very uh, high engagement and decided to invite you guys for the second interview. I, I, so, I think I guess that means Aidan did okay. Yeah, he's, he's a good colleague of mine. I've known him for a while. Right. So today we will do a deep dive into security controls as a strategic enable, uh, enabler and uh, talk about the many important things that uh, auditors have been uh, asking about. So Frank, for those viewers who didn't uh, watch the first interview, can you perhaps tell us uh, a little bit about what you and your, your team at FastPath are up to? Absolutely, so FastPath is a software company uh, in, the, in the GRC space. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time working with customers around, go around governance, risk and compliance, uh, specifically developing uh, great solutions that work uh, to provide the right controls you need from security, audit and compliance perspective, and it's controls around business software. So the traditional accounting systems, ERP systems, as they continue to evolve now, just business software systems. So SAP, Oracle, Microsoft Dynamics, NetSuite, uh, those are the types of systems we work with. Uh, however, the last couple of years, as, as the really the ERP space has evolved, similar to security in the cloud, we've also moved our solutions into other uh, business software solutions such as Workday on the HR side, Salesforce, Coupa. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, controls are important for companies big or small, and many, many business software solutions either are lacking the controls us auditors like to see, or the controls that, that are in place natively with the software uh, require you to do a lot of manual processes. So FastPath really fills that gap that exists there, and we've developed a set of solutions um, starting way back when, 16 years ago, actually going on 17 years ago, here in the States, uh, around Sarbanes, Oxley, or Sox, and some compliance needs there. Uh, for Microsoft's back then, it was called Great Plains Solution, and the company's really evolved from there. Um, we, again, we don't offer professional services, but we have a lot of really smart people who understand security inside these different systems, how it works, and where the data is at specifically. We map that with then the knowledge we also have with our accountants and auditors and staff that understand how controls need to be designed in software to ultimately provide confidence, not only if you get audited, but confidence to the CFO and the CIO and the CISO that their internal control system is designed and operating correctly. And part of that design is strong controls in the area of security. And so we provide that, fill that, fill that gap that's there. Uh, and we have probably now, geez, 1,200 plus customers in 30 different countries. And uh, again, we've been doing this for 17 years. And we work quite closely as well with the accounting and audit community. Uh, my role at FastPath, I do a lot of that actually. Uh, working with the big four and Grant Thornton and RSM and, and ProTivity, there's a long list of audit partners we have that are using our solutions out in the marketplace to audit their clients, to provide services, whether it's external audit, internal audit, uh, security re-architecture projects. And then also we have lots and lots of system integrators, uh, implementers out there that are, that are helping their clients with implementing fast path to meet their security needs as well. All right, very, very interesting. So let's start with a, uh, with a question that you, you probably have to answer many times. What should audit look at the IT security and the cyber world? Yeah, so that, that's a great question that continues to evolve. Uh, I was doing a, a, a webinar, actually a virtual session for an institute in Toronto conference the other day and that exact question came up. And, and with cybersecurity now and the evolution of all the tools out there, uh, it is a different approach to what the auditors are asking for and what they're looking for. Uh, in the past, they used to be very, very focused on the ITGC, uh, your IT general controls. Uh, as an example, testing the process for granting someone new access and following that paper trail, if you will, the, the user access request form. Uh, asking basic questions about do you test your code uh, before you move it to, to production from a development perspective. Now with cyber, the threat landscape is much more broader. 
and they're having to worry about security and the controls on the outside or the external threats, but still worry about security on the inside, uh, the internal threats, the fraud that could exist, the areas where traditionally they ask those ITGC questions, but now they're having to ask even deeper questions because of the technologies evolved. And when you move applications to the cloud, they're not only asking questions and the auditors are not only looking at areas they have in the past, but now they're asking questions about the key vendors you work with, that you integrate with. Uh, everyone now has software solutions, past path no different, that they've added on to their core business software systems via an API or web services. Auditors are having to ask questions about how you go through vendor management and what questions are you asking those key vendors you're now doing business with electronically, if you will. Uh, do you know the controls they have in place to develop their product? Uh, if, if your solution's hosted in the cloud, like Microsoft's hosted in Microsoft Azure, uh, do you ask questions about the hoster and the controls they have to keep your data safe? Those are all questions that auditors never had asked in the past. And then you have the cybersecurity questions as well that in the past maybe touched upon a little bit from a network infrastructure perspective, but it's, it's more important than ever to ask those questions how you're protecting the perimeter uh, of your environment, of your, of, your, of your company. The old data center, if you will, which is now probably a data center room. Still important to keep the, the software and the hardware in that room secure, but also as your employees now work remotely, especially in this COVID world, and we, uh, we've been talking a lot about this lately, with security in a work from home world, what, what are you doing and what questions should they be asking to make sure your employees are still working securely from home? Good basic principles around strong IT security and awareness and not to open up phishing emails and the like. Lots more questions for auditors to ask, especially from external side, but there's, there's one key stat I like to quote, and the Association of Certified, Internal, uh, Certified uh, Fraud Examiners came out with their annual report in it to the nation's study recently, and it looks at fraud, uh, specifically uh, occupational fraud, whether intentional or not, in the space, and they only, only sampled 2,500 companies, but they identified $3.6 million of fraud in those 2,500 companies, extrapolated the data out and estimate that 5% of revenue for all companies around the globe will be uh, part will be charged to fraud this year. It will happen. The majority of that fraud is internal. So while it's important to talk about cybersecurity and all the controls and keeping the bad guys and guys gals out, there's a huge component still inside your company that you need to worry about your own systems and what you're doing control-wise, including your accounting systems, your HR systems, your CRM systems. That occupational fraud happens, whether it's intentional or not, and, and you need to have a good eye on that. And auditors are asking more and more about that as well. Okay, so what have you learned uh, in this uh, couple of months on the importance of security uh, changed in the new COVID and the work from home world? Great, great question. I, I think what we've learned is that the larger companies, your enterprise companies that have large IT staffs, have large help desks, uh, have large security groups, they were better positioned to transition their workforce immediately to a work from home world. Not just because they had the resources, but also they could spend the time, they had programs already to educate those users and quickly give them directions for setting up computers at home. Here's the security guidelines for working from home. And those guidelines are not just for you, the employee, but anyone that uses that computer. Uh, making sure they have the right antivirus and the right malware protection and the right patches for their operating systems on their home computers. Those larger companies had groups already that had developed that type of guidance. They just had to push that out to their distributed employees now working from home. Unfortunately, the smaller companies, which fraud happens just as much, in fact, I could argue a 25, uh, uh, let's say a quarter million dollar fraud in a smaller company could bring us to his knees and probably put out a business. Uh, and that only has to happen once. Larger company, Fortune 10, Fortune 100, uh, they can stomach that. A smaller company can't. But that smaller company has just as much exposure in the work from home world to all these threats as the larger company. And those are the ones with the, maybe they have two people in their IT department, they don't have a help desk, uh, they've really not done much with security awareness training historically inside their company to begin with, they did not have programs to fall back on to quickly push out to the distributed folks to educate them about the need for security at home. Uh, I used to, I speak a lot about security and one of the, the quotes I like is the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. It takes one weak link to break down the, the, the chain from a security perspective. 
uh, ironically, that's very similar to COVID right now, that, that you could social distance, do all the right things, and you're, if one person's not doing the right thing, that chain can break the, the whole link when it comes from a COVID exposure perspective. But from a security perspective, extremely important. And these smaller companies that initially maybe weren't prepared to, one, work from home uh, as far as uh, resources go with hardware and making sure the employees had the right equipment, and two, did they have the right solutions that immediately can they deploy distributively to work from home? But three, they didn't have a lot of stuff already in place to educate their users about the need for strong security and to give that to their users so they could share with their family. There's, there's many, many, many companies that have employees work from home still where there might be only one computer and one internet access in the home. And that computer is shared by the students working from home, uh, shared by their spouse, and do they all understand the right and the wrong way uh, to use your computer and the things to look out for? Us IT, us IT, us audit people do, but we need to be careful we don't make the assumption everyone knows that. And I think that's been the biggest challenge. The smaller size companies working from home, it's easy to say, okay, just log in remotely. But really the security around that device, that link is indeed secure. And how do you educate your users to keep it secure? All right. So how do organizations get, get more than one, only one IT uh, department to engage and believe in the need for strong security? So, so and, and that goes back to that last part. So uh, I like to draw an analogy. When it comes to security, to do it correctly, it's a company-wide project with executive support. Hmm, where does that sound familiar? Hopefully, that's the same way your company ran the project when it implemented SAP or Oracle, or NetSuite, or Microsoft Dynamics, or Salesforce, or any of these large business software solutions that your company probably uses when you first implemented it, or when you upgrade, it's a company-wide project. You need to have an executive steering committee with buy-in, the CIO, the CFO, the CISO, uh, the COO, the other executives understanding why implementing that software was important the long-range goals of your company. The exact same thing is true with security. It's not just an IT project. And, and us as auditors, a lot of times we see companies that think security is just an, an IT thing. In some cases, an IT headache. We have to do it, but it's, a, it's something we prefer not to do. It, it's something that doesn't allow us to, to sell more software. It doesn't allow us to build more cars. It doesn't allow us to acquire more customers. Well, I can make a strong case that security is a, a strategic enabler, and we'll talk probably more about that later. But ultimately, to do security right, it has to have the executive commitment, and then it trickles down all the way down to the lowest levels of organization. And that's where the security awareness is so critical. You might have someone working from home today, then in the past worked in an office in the back of a plant, and maybe never talked to someone in IT. Uh, so their, their world was to support the plant working their little office. Uh, now they're working from home. Uh, they need to understand why what IT is asking them to do is so critically important to the entire security of the company, again, that weakest link. And if you don't set up a security project with executive commitment from the top down, educating people all the way down and putting the right resources, the right dollars, and the right executive commitment into it, it's gonna be very difficult for your employees to buy into it. And certainly from an investment perspective to then do the right things once your company puts the right security controls in place and starts to require a periodic review of users access. and starts to require running segregation of duty reviews. It starts to require looking at sensitive access more closely. It starts to require tracking changes of critical data. All those controls that we at FastPass sell solutions for, but more importantly, also as auditors, we're asking questions about, and there are strong controls in the new place. The people actually using the tools to implement those controls need to understand why it's important. And if you don't educate people, you don't explain to them that it's part of a broader security policy, you're ultimately going to end up people that maybe don't do the, the tasks how they're supposed to. Maybe this quarter they don't look at all the user access because they don't understand why it's important. So ultimately strong security starts with executive commitment. It starts with putting the right resources there and the right education, explaining why it's a company-wide project and it's not just an IT project. And then the other thing I'll throw in there, sometimes companies make the mistake, similar to when they implement business software, thinking that the software's the silver bullet that just implement the security software and it'll, it'll make all your problems go away. It'll make the auditors happy. It'll provide the controls we need. The only way to really do things correctly where there's any project around compliance, whether it's security, audit, reg government regulations, what have you, your executive commitment, but also understand that security, you get to it by people 
plus process, plus technology. So technology is a piece, but people and process are an equal piece. And if you don't educate people that correctly, without adding those th three things together, you won't have the strong controls around security that you need. So you just explained that uh, security is not really only about uh, strong security uh, te technical solution, but what yes. is it all about how to choose the best framework for sec security control from your point of view? Yeah, so, so there's lots and lots of guidelines out there, lots of frameworks out there to follow. And depending on what industry you're in, the auditor and me would tell you first, you need to figure out if there's any specific regulations you need to be following. If, here in the States, we have the FDA. Uh, and, and there's lots of guidelines they have that you have to follow around security for manufacturing medical devices, prescription drugs, and what have you. Um, if you work in government here in the States, FedRAMP is another a regulation you have to look at. So the first thing you have to do, framework-wise, is figure out if there's regulations or some standards you have to follow. In, in today's privacy world, I, I'm sure you're very familiar with it. I'm somewhat familiar with it. I've actually done some work with FastPath internally with it and, and spoken at some conferences about GDPR. And, and the privacy of personal data. Another regulation that you have to worry about out here. In the States, we're starting to see some of that here with California has their own version of it, CCPA. At the end of the day, there's gonna be either international or state and local regulations, standards that you have to follow from a security perspective. So that's the first thing you need to identify. And then second, you need to realize, in addition to meeting those standards, there's also different frameworks, different groups have put out there to make it easier to build security the right way with the right controls that will meet those standards. So uh, the NIFS framework, the ISO uh, 27001 and the like frameworks, they're out there as a guideline, as a roadmap to help you with setting up a very broad security program from how you manage the security program to the technical approach you should have to the education of users. So I, I would encourage everyone to look at a lot of the free resources that are out there around these different frameworks by design as they've been developed they want to push that out to the different businesses to have access to. And again, a small, medium-sized company, your two-person IT shop can pull down some of the information that's free and use that as a good starting point. Now, one caveat there, and again, I'd like to draw analogies to strong security and building it out correctly to implement in business software. We used to always say when we implement ERP software, it's just like eating an elephant. You eat an elephant one bite at a time. Even though an elephant might be huge, you can't eat it all at once. Same with implementing business software. You can't do everything at once. You can't make everyone happy the first time. Same with security. You have to take a risk-based approach. You're not going to set up security the same way across your entire organization, big or small, because different parts of data, different business processes, different parts of your business operations are have a higher risk compared to other parts of your organization. And in the past path, we spent a lot of time working with our customers about talking, taking a risk-based approach to security. That applies as well in this scenario. You need to figure out where you need to invest your time and money based on the risk profile of your company, where the threats are, and then basically make some business decisions. If we have X amount of dollars to, to spend this year on security, let's map that up against our risk assessment of our business and where we think the most of the holes are in the highest risk areas. And let's put a fair amount of dollars there first uh, because ultimately, uh, Again, here in the States, there uh, used to be a famous bank robber called Jesse James. And the little joke is, why did Jesse James rob all the banks? Because that's where the money was. My money was. So <laughs> from, from a security audit perspective and a risk and control perspective, you need to protect your most important assets. And if you don't do a risk assessment, you don't really know where those are, or where the risks and where the threats are. So that's how I would approach it initially. But again, people plus process plus technology is not just a silver bullet technical solution. Mm -hmm. So once the framework in place, who actually owns security inside an organization? Is <laughs> IT, audit, business units? Yeah. What is your take? Yes. On? So, so unfortunately, I think what we find a lot is that, especially again in small organizations, even after they implement it, security is considered to be owned by IT. And, and that, that's just a, a flawed approach. Uh, IT may be the ones doing the most with security, provisioning users running reports, they probably, if you have an information security department, it probably rolls up through IT. But that's, that's the operation side of security. It doesn't mean it's the same as the ownership side. Ultimately, strong security is owned across the organization at the executive level. Uh, in the past, and again, I've, I've been around a long time and I worked corporate audit for 
for Verizon for many, many years, starting out in the late 80s. I, I can tell you security back then was viewed just as an IT thing. I was an IT auditor, we'd go out and do IT audits. When we'd audit the data center, we would just present, present the results of our, of our data center audit to the CIO and his or her organization. Not the business users, not the COO, not the CFO. And that was unique and it was flawed back then because ultimately, who is using all those applications that run in the data center? The different business units spread out across your business operations. So their data, their applications exist in a data center. They have just as much a stake to know that it's controlled correctly as do the IT people that are working daily in that data center. So take that now 30 plus years uh, from an owning security perspective. Ultimately, it needs to be owned and be committed to from all your executives. The CFO is worried about your accounting system, obviously, and generating strong financial statements. But also the CFO now has to worry about a business relationships you have and dollars going in and out and other things that involve technology. Uh, the CIO was always worried about controls from an IT perspective, but now they have to worry about the different operations and applications they have to support the business uh, that might be more distributed, might be in the cloud. And that to work closely with the sales function, the manufacturing function, uh, the HR function. Uh, your CISOs now, Chief Information Security Officers, they're oftentimes viewed as the owner security. We split that off from the CIO. Ultimately, I would argue still strong security has to have executive commitment and ownership across the company. And when they talk about security, those, the CFO, the CIO, the CEO, the CISO need to be involved. I know here in the States, uh, the, uh, there was guidelines that came out from the PCAOB years ago, a couple years ago now, that said publicly traded companies, when their board meets, and that's usually every quarter, they have to talk about cybersecurity. Well, your board members aren't all IT people. That's your board now talking about security. If, the, if it's good enough for the boards to talk about it, people with different backgrounds, it's good enough for your executives to talk about it and be committed to and understand they all are a part of that ownership of security. That doesn't mean, however, what IT does is not as important as it has been in the past. Operationally, IT is still the biggest component, execution-wise, to what's going on with security and all the things they do. All right. Uh, so summarizing, if someone who is listening to this interview would like to walk away with one or two major takeaways, what would it be? So, um, number one, that the company's big or small, Controls are important. Um, yes, we talked about a lot of that at Fast Path because we're in the business of selling solutions there. But that taking off my Fast Path hat, actually, I got my Fast Path hat right here. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it off for a second. Uh, I put my auditor hat on. I don't have an auditor hat, unfortunately, for us. But uh, controls are important for any company because ultimately they protect you, big or small, public or private. So it doesn't matter if you're getting audited or not. When you hear people talk about the need for strong controls and strong internal control system. That applies to your Fortune 10 companies and multi-billion dollar companies. And that applies to the, uh, the mom and pop, the husband and wife company, that maybe is only doing $100,000 a year, but perhaps they're using a computer. The threat and the risk, and again, going back to the uh, report to the nations by the Certified Association of Fraud Examiners, that threat's out there with fraud. You need to have the right controls in place, big or small to protect you financially, operationally, and from IT perspectives. That's the first thing I would say, is don't, don't think that worrying about strong controls are just a thing if you get out of it. It's not. And then the, the second thing I would say is the key take back uh, is if you are getting audited, uh, the relationship you have with audit should be a positive one. Uh, you talked to really about who owns security. Is it IT? Is it the business owners? Is it, is it, is it uh, audit? Uh, Ultimately, if you are working with auditors and work with an organization that is, they are there to be an enabler to make your company more successful. We talk about security as a strategic enabler to companies. Auditors serve a purpose. Sometimes it seems adversarial. And again, the person they're auditing may not understand why the audit is important in this broader scheme of things from an internal control system. I'll go back to a change only as strong as the weakest link from a security perspective. The same holds true with your internal control system. If there's parts of your organization that don't have the strongest controls, that one weak link can be compromised. That could lead to that part of that 3.6 billion of fraud last year alone in only 2,500 cases in across 125 different companies the Certified Association of Fraud Examiners saw. So don't be afraid of the auditors. Know they're there to help you and work with you. And ultimately, 
and again, this is more on the internal audit side, but even external audit side, that what they're doing is, is there to, to protect your company, one, but two, put in a better position from a strategic perspective. And I think sometimes us as auditors get pigeonholed into an adversarial relationship. We've worked really hard over the years trying to build how we communicate better with the, with the folks in the business, uh, how we explain to them better what we're doing. But ultimately, it's about education, uh, education for strong security, education for strong audit, education for strong internal control systems, period. And remember, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Frank, for, for your time. And uh, I wish you and your company uh, high uh, uh, growth. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we can see you more on our community at the globalriskcommunity.com. Absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity, Boris, and I look forward to meeting you in person too, soon. Hopefully I'll be over at a conference in, in the Netherlands sometime here in 2021, perhaps, and we can, we can meet in person. Appreciate Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great bye -bye. day. Bye-bye.